This is a perfect segue for us to bring on our next speaker, who has flown in specially from Mumbai in India. We'd like to bring to the stage one of the most uh, important visionaries in mobile and in the mobile space. Neeraj Roy was right there at the very beginning of mobile content and mobile entertainment and mobile everything, really. Neeraj is based in India, but operates all over the world. Let's bring Neeraj on stage. Neeraj Roy, the founder of Hungama and person very responsible for Polygon Media, the big uh, metaverse. Uh, but Neeraj, give Neeraj a big round of applause. Neeraj, I will. welcome. Thank you. Thank Neeraj, you. let's first say in Hindi, Aap kaisa hai? Main bohat hi tandurust aur khush hoon. Thank you very much. Very good. Neeraj, yeah. very well, warm welcome. And Neeraj, uh, if I can just start by saying this. NFTs are crypto assets that record the ownership of digital items. They're on a blockchain, a type of database, where information is stored in blocks. Once that block is filled, it's linked to another, which makes it nearly impossible to hack or cheat the system. NFTs are unique and rare that cannot be easily reproduced, and everyone, though, can view them or download them, and only the buyer can claim ownership. So tell us what you've been doing in India and give us some sense of Hungama and sure. Polygon. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Ralph and Jim and Charles. Uh, wonderful interaction. I've been hearing you folks backstage. So very quickly, just to give you a little background to Hangama is a digital media entertainment company uh, we founded uh, in, 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 uh, in Mumbai. And we've been in pretty much all things digital and entertainment. So from music to video to gaming uh, to live experiences, roughly about 90 million consumers access our service each month. We live in about 49 countries. And uh, a big part of this is driven from the fact that when you look at Indian cinema, or Bollywood, as is known uh, globally, it's now viewed in 127 countries. Uh, it's dubbed in 35 different languages. We sell about 4.3 billion admission tickets each year. And over the last two decades, as the economic interest in India has grown, and you know, whether it's India, Germany, India, Japan, India, US, India, UK, uh, so is the interest culturally, whether it's to do with food, uh, it's to do with entertainment, art, is all sort of coming alive. And it's with that backdrop that we built this business. About two years back, I ended up doing a little course. I had been studying blockchain and I had uh, spoken at a couple of forums. But I chose to do this with my daughter, Kyra, who was 15 at that point in time, because something told me that if I approached this, you know, with my two decade or digital experience, I would still be reasonably cynical about this. Uh, and that entire program uh, led me into the world of NFTs. Uh, and with that, we initiated, so what we are doing now is uh, we're launching a platform which is going to be across entertainment, art, gaming, uh, and fashion lifestyle under the brand of Hefty, Hefty Entertainment, which is in partnership with Polygon. Polygon Tell us about Polygon, Neeraj. Sure. So Polygon is a, uh, is a layer two uh, blockchain company. Uh, it is amongst the top 10 uh, blockchain companies in the world. They've sort of hyper-focused on DeFi and enabling the entire uh, NFT ecosystem. Uh, and with this partnership, uh, what we are doing is we're bringing we're essentially looking to sort of democratize the entire space of uh, uh, content which is centered around entertainment. So we're starting off with uh, music and movies. Uh, one of the partnerships that we have uh, just recently announced is uh, with Asia's largest uh, record label and studio. This is a company called T-Series. Uh, we've entered into an exclusive partnership they are by far the largest producers of uh, films across uh, India. Uh, they have a YouTube uh, community of about 390 million consumers. And the idea is we want to bring in the world of NFTs, not just from the perspective of collectibles only, as Charles was talking about. Uh, you know, when you look at the collectible market uh, globally, it's about a $370 billion market. Ralph, uh, to put it in perspective, that's like two and a half times the size of the film world uh, globally. It's probably about, uh, you know, nearly twice the size of the world gaming market. But 
we've, and obviously in the last two years, there's over $25 billion worth of uh, transactions that have happened. You know, the point where Charles is making 8 million transactions on OpenSea, et cetera. Uh, so we are seeing this because we find that we come from a nation which produces about 1,500 films a year. Uh, they're very passionate about their cinema. Uh, the fans really connect with them. So we want to uh, give them more access. So there is a collectible element to it, but there is also what we call as a utility feature that's being brought into these NFTs. And those utilities could lead to experiences like money can't buy, experiences they could lead to a walkabout role, a meet and greet uh, of the star. Uh, and every, I visualize a scenario, you know, the next four, five years, a market like India, which is embracing blockchain very, very sort of uh, meaningfully, uh, we're already at roughly about 4.6 billion transactions that are happening through digital. To Jim's point uh, about what you launched here in, in Spain, and it's, it's fascinating, congratulations on that. So we see a world where roughly about 500 million consumers will come into this broader metaverse which is getting built out uh, from the region that we are in. And time and again, Ralph, we've seen whether it's a transition of 1.0 or 2.0, or now what we're talking, 3.0. The entertainment industry has been a very big catalyst for the adoption of this metaverse, or for the adoption of any new transition. And that's how we are seeing this. So, we want to build this across these different uh, platforms from gaming to movies, but with the intention of giving fans more, you know, a closer look, because that's really what the metaverse is going to be building on. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about that as well, with you. So, Neeraj, would I be correct in saying that we're kind of in a more of a privacy era? This is not everybody sharing everything on the same platform. This is people wanting to get their own kind of private Garden of Eden that they can then have on their mobile devices. Tell us more about the mobile process of this, because when you said that NFTs, certainly in your part of the world, has gone from zero to $25 billion in two years. No, but, that's globally, not, not globally, just. Globally, yes. I beg your pardon. But basically, mobile is really the transmission channel yes. yeah. for this, and it's the combination of physical and digital. How would you frame that? So, I think, I think privacy is a very uh, uh, critical part, particularly when you look at Web3, uh, and you look at this decentralized world that's happening. So if I were to just go back, say, 10 years, if you look at the start of Web2, the start of Web2 in that social was a big catalyst for it, you know, the whole emergence of social media becoming big. And if I were to, you know, uh, even be sort of harsh enough to say the sunset of Web2, privacy is a big issue. Uh, and as I look at the sort of rise of Web3, one of the components we are finding is this younger generation is almost echoing to say, no, in perhaps even some rebellious ways, to say that, you know, I want that privacy back. And the world, NFTs as well, are just one explain, uh, you know, sort of manifestation of that. Because this is a community which is now talking things like, you know, on blockchain you can do zero proof identity, you know, you don't need to go in and go around sort of, you know, giving your gender or, or, or uh, facial recognition, etc., to prove ownership on things. So the way we see NFTs, we see NFTs almost like a key, like a, like a gateway, and it is beautifully placed between this transition from 2.0 to 3.0 that's happening. And when I start thinking of how the metaverse is going to evolve, it's, it's akin to, you know, say, switch back maybe 1970s, early 80s or so. If at that time somebody asked us, you know, how will the internet look like? You know, the protocols were set, but the applications, the layers, uh, the connectivity, the device, that ecosystem was not there. I think that's where we are the next decade. So on the one side, you have uh, these seven big tech companies who've all sort of announced their plans of the metaverse. And by the way, it can only be, you know, it cannot be versus, it is a verse, and it has to be by its very term, it must be one. 
But they've, you know, they're creating APIs and, and virtualization of uh, how it will be. And just to, for the interest of the audience, here we are, four of us, we're having this physical, you know, meeting. I visualize the next three, four years, our digital Ralph and virtual Jim, or, you know, will equally be having potentially five, seven other meetings in the metaverse. And with AI, you will, you will enable how much of that social interaction or, you know, that aunt that you don't really want to meet, but you say, all right, I'll go ahead and meet uh, virtually, uh, will pan out. And in this, I keep seeing NFTs as this, this token, this, this, this little gateway, because NFTs have really originated from the gaming world, right? In the gaming world, it's not uncommon to say, okay, I'll get this jewel and that leads me to the next level of sorts. So we're really looking at this as a means by which we democratize and usher in uh, the advent to Web3 in potentially all the good that we've had from the earlier and essentially try and weed out you know, what's not required and privacy is certainly one of them. So this is really the mobile virtual reality space, immersive technologies, the metaverse and particularly Polygon just showing what they do with a lot of its basis on the Ethereum platform, but certainly doing this kind of stuff. Niraj, do you think that we can coin a phrase here where you've mentioned something about physical and digital? Are we in the digital era? We're not fidgeting, <laughs> it's the digital era, physical and digital. What do you say well, about well, that? Well, well, well it, is, it is, Ralph, and uh, I have a little video which will sort of summarize a little bit of what we are doing and how we are doing this. And uh, this is our, our way of, uh, it's a token to numerous markets. As I said, you know, the entertainment economy uh, essentially embraces and ushers in, uh, you know, it's, it's a catalyst to adoption. So this digital is something that we've also coined. So one of the art auctions, by the way, uh, Charles, we were speaking at the backstage, uh, of M.F. Hussain, uh, arguably the Picasso of India, most prolific painter. We've announced a drop, and that's going to be both a physical as well, a virtual and NFT as well. So maybe we'll play this video now. Okay, let's roll the video. This is something interesting to see. Let's go for it. Roll the video.
Oh, Nero. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think of that? I mean, you're a little bit quiet, maybe you're all shocked, but you can see that this gives you a glimpse into the future and uh, to, well, gentlemen, all, all three of you, and hopefully next year we'll have some ladies in on our session as well because women are very important in constructing some of this new world. The one thing that we haven't spoken about in this is how do brands participate in this? Charles, I know that essentially you're looking at uh, your auction elements, there are 70 different categories, but uh, do, uh, Jim, do you have any uh, sense, or Neeraj, do you have any thoughts about it? Brands can participate in the metaverse, brands can participate in NFTs. Jim, how about you? So uh, I think Neeraj said the most profound thing that I've heard of the conference so far, and you slipped it in, and I just want to highlight it, which is that there is a generational shift in thinking which is that the young folks don't want their identities owned. They want to own their own identities. So if you think about brands, and I'm going to answer your question, but it's really important. If you think about the stuff that creates all the media that we consume, right. most of it is paid for by brands. Right. There are only five subscriptions in the English language that support uh, direct content. The rest of the stuff is, is paid for by you trading your attention to brands. So the question is, how is that trade conducted? And right now it's conducted through a platform that is giving you stuff for free, but they then own your identity. And I think if we have an opportunity to transition from a world where there's this intermediary that is probably not acting in my best interest to transact in a way that I want, in other words, I own my identity, then the brands will have to deal with me directly. So little things like this, I think, are super significant. And that point you made, I was like, yeah, that's, that's why I come to this thing. Because it's, it's, it's not to see, you know, 5G, right? Um, it's to see what's around the corner. Right, exactly. Charles, what was your view on hearing about some of this? Because, of course, some of your new digital artists, even Banksy, for example, is not fully digital, um, are brands in the world of art and collectibles. Yeah, um, Banksy is not digital at all, uh, by the way. I mean, we, we, have, we have accepted cryptocurrency and, and certain selling some of his paintings because he as an outsider artist has connected with the crypto community in an interesting right. way. Um, but, um, I, you know, I fully agree that, that's, that this change in behavior, whether it's technology adoption, generational, um, is leading to a massive convergence of, you know, a lot of things that we consumed, and I thought Niraj's video summed it up uh, quite nicely, where you're seeing culture, fashion, art, music, food, you know, converging in ways all, um, you know, facilitated by technology. It also, I meant to say this earlier, makes it much easier for creators to connect directly with audiences. Right. And I think Jim has got uh, a future as a, as a, a, a NFT glass blowing uh, token <laughs> creator, perhaps. There might be a big audience for that that you didn't even know about in this new world. <laughs> Neeraj, what's your view on brands? Because obviously brands play such an important part. You've got 500 million mobile wallet users in India alone. 500 yeah. million, half a billion. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I want to I stay on, 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 on the part which uh, Jim highlighted and uh, bring this entire thing of even what brands do in this word called utility. And it's very important that when you look at the world of NFTs, most of us, we get carried away by the core hype which is centered around the crypto world and the liquidity and, you know, the sort of sheer rise of, so just to put in context, I mean, like eight years ago, uh, the broader crypto economy was about 150 billion. Uh, to its peak last year, it was about two and a half trillion. Now that, <laughs> for a global GDP of about 85 trillion, if you were to look at that as an asset class, as some of the prominent bankers are now even proposing, it's fascinating because there's another asset class which humanity has known now for 5,000 years, which is gold. And gold is 10 trillion in value, and there's about 2,800 to 3,000 tons of gold which gets physically mined and dropped <laughs> into stores, and it's that. And here is a sort of new emerging asset class, which is today still sitting at about 1.8 trillion or so. So I think it's important that even when brands come in, they have to be conscious of the fact that one of the edifices of Web3 
is going to be a very big paradigm change in the way privacy is. So you can put in those utilities, and I bought myself an NFT, but I will choose whether I want to unlock that value that Adidas has given into it. There are some use cases which for brand may come sense purely because of the virtualization of the metaverse that will happen. So I bought this virtual pair of sneakers, and I want to play the Fortnite game, and I want to show off those sneakers, or, or, or Jim's uh, you know, sort of Federal Reserve hoodie inside of that game. That world is, is, is all right, but when it comes to brands, it's not going to be the way brand and data uh, was really hawked this last decade in, in a manner which has really you know, taken things to an extreme end right now. Charles, what do you say to that? I completely agree. I mean, I think that um, uh, brands uh, are, are definitely looking um, um, at uh, NFTs as an opportunity to build and create and engage communities in, in a totally different, different way. Uh, we're seeing that. I also think, um, you know, blockchain as a certificate of ownership, you know, they can be redeemable certificates of ownership. So sometimes, you know, we're seeing things where somebody may purchase an NFT that gives you the right to a physical object, but they never actually come collect the physical object. The, the token, maybe they trade that, and if someday somebody wants to own the physical object. So that has sort of broader, more profound implications for, uh, for brands and, and for commerce, you know, more generally, perhaps. That's one of the, certainly one of the things we're seeing as well. Charles, do you think that the metaverse is a new era, particularly for the art that Sotheby's represents. But when you look, for example, at the Naked Bored Ape series um, by the artist uh, that created it and the lab that created that, uh, are you seeing this natural bridge into the so-called, well, it's not so-called, it is the metaverse? I, I uh, don't think that the physical art world and the digital art world have to converge together. I think there's right. plenty of room. Just in the physical art world, there's lots and lots of categories. Um, the, the NFT um, world is, is another one, but, but I do think that um, uh, what's interesting about the NFT community is, is how big it is. And for sure, some of that is linked to crypto and speculation and sort of new adopters of things, but there is a core group that is very large uh, and very global who is interested, following this actively, very, very engaged, that's a really exciting thing. It gives me hope about, you know, the future of, of art in an increasingly, you know, digital world. So absolutely, I think, um, I, I think we'll, we'll see more of that, yeah. So Jim, effectively, you can use your mobile device to show this off. You don't have to put a painting on a wall as one would have done in earlier times with art, but effectively, it's the payment mechanism that will allow you to get your collectible onto your device. And the whole mobile drive of this is obviously what drives Square and has done now for, since you developed this 13 years ago, but give us some sense of just the significance of mobile and mobile payments and the fintech elements of the way that this is effectively the river that this is flowing through. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. The, the economic model under your system makes a big difference in the outcomes you get from that system. So um, what we've got right now is this massive transition going on between a, um, a, a, a model, at least for, for content, which is largely monetized by the intermediaries. Right. Uh, where we think we will eventually we'll end up in a world where individuals, the endpoints, the seller and the buyer will have more power than the platform that connects them. And, and that's where we're building tools. And we don't exactly know what the tools are. So, um, I mean, I announced two products today. Both of those, like, literally hit this week. They're, they're disastrously buggy. <laughs> but eventually they will be stable. Eventually they will be good. And maybe people will like them, or maybe they won't. Half the stuff I invent, nobody wants. But some of it, they do. So, here's the thing. I think we're probably all off, all better off in a world where we have control. Right. But in order for us to have control, the platforms, the people who build these things, have to relinquish that control. So Square's newest division, TBD, which is doing our crypto uh, work, is, is open source. Mm. We share our work, and we're building tools to 
basically free these, uh, these constraints so that there is not some central platform. I know this is scary, you know, for those of you who work for central platforms in the audience, but like you, the, the, the platform has to either relinquish control or it has to be routed around by some independent thing where the control is maintained by the endpoints. And when I say endpoints, I mean people. We are the endpoint. You want that as part of your nexus of control. Yeah. So, Neeraj. I thought particularly when he was saying about, you know, those of you in the central platforms, <laughs> uh, you know, you should have put the hoodie on. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and this is the central platform. This is this the Federal is, Reserve, folks. Is, you know, like Sith Lord. <laughs> I don't but, wear this when I vote on interest no, rates. But, but just to the point uh, on, uh, you, you said, where will they show this? And I've asked this question as well. You know, you bought yourself an NFT. And <laughs> in art, there is a component which is, you know, intrinsic, right? You, you, you like it because you, you appreciate it, but you also, there's bragging associated with it. And I don't know how many of you eight, 10 years back saw this video called The World of Glass. We're coming back to you again, Jim. The World of Glass, which is all about the screens in every form. So today, every sort of t television is a smart TV, right? And you have in that inbuilt a wallpaper that's coming. So when you've bought those NFTs, there will be various ways you will be able to showcase that. And at all times, remember, there is the art in it, and then there is the utility in it. And it's the combination of that which really sort of makes it that much more of a powerful proposition, and hopefully an exciting one. So Charles, here's something. You've sold some of the most valuable pieces of art in the world. I don't know exactly what the highest uh, piece of art uh, price was in the Sotheby's 277-year uh, history, but uh, you know, we're now, and you so perfectly described this new balcony view that we're looking at of the future. Um, this is not going away. This is going to consolidate. And from what you're seeing with your stats, and particularly with the younger generation of digital natives that are so much more attuned to getting stuff that is digital, physical and digital, give us your take on whether you feel optimistic about this in terms of widening the way that aesthetics, culture, fashion, creativity is playing a role in mobile? Well, I think that uh, that's a lot to, to unpack, I think, but the, this idea of, of fidgetal in the art world is really important because uh, in the old days or pre-pandemic, which is not that long ago, but feels like the old days, um, you know, we were a, a physical, largely a physical marketplace. And then we went to almost exclusively a digital marketplace in, in a world of travel restrictions and um, only digital engagement. And now we are in this hybrid, hybrid world. We, we are selling um, five Monet paintings this afternoon at an auction in London. You can watch it on your mobile device at 5 p.m. today. It's a live experience. I think on average we're seeing a million viewers um, in these live auctions that are now broadcast on our platform. So that's an example of um, you know, digital technology, mobile technology, expanding the audience for traditional art in a quantum, in a quantum way. Pre-pandemic, we would have had three, four, 500 people perhaps in a room, like a, a purely physical live theater, West End uh, theater experience. And now, um, on average, a million viewers and in our biggest sales, you know, uh, multiple millions. So I, uh, that does, um, you know, in, in terms of our mission being to expand access uh, to you know, exceptional art across lots of categories. Um, these tools and the promise of what we're talking about on this stage is, is incredibly exciting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope, we hope, all of us hope, that this gives you at least some idea of the way that mobile is driving this whole area. So it is with great thanks that we say thank you to Jim. Jim, for uh, giving us this great insight. Charles, for you just showing us that um, over the long period of time that Sotheby's has been going, this is almost like a whole new area. Neeraj, thanks to you for uh, showing just how important this area is. The metaverse is not going away. Hopefully today is your first course in the metaversity, not the university, but the metaversity. And also, maybe we've coined a phrase, physical and digital, we are all going to be fidgetal. So, Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm round of applause to our great, great speakers. Thank you so much.
Let's take a picture for history, because maybe in years to come, we might be able to sell the NFT of this oh, photograph <laughs> for millions of dollars. And when we're very, very old in our wheelchairs, we can show our kids that this is what created the metaverse and NFTs at the Mobile World Congress 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you. Neeraj, Charles, Jim, thank you so much. Totally great. Great. Really.